Hi there. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> this is Michigan Outdoors, as you can tell. I'm here with a very, very friendly buck deer. His name is Maynard. We're at the Houghton Lake Deer Research Station, and uh, you're going to hear all about Maynard in just a minute, because it's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. Maynard is, is nipping my glove here. What is the story, John? He's... <laughs> He doesn't hurt he's, very much. Uh, he's a team buck that was uh, brought in last spring, and he was bottle raised. He's lost his fear, man. Well, he certainly has lost his fear, man. Maynard, what do you find in there? He's maybe some salt or something, or could be. So Maynard is how old? Did you say? Come on he's, down here, John. This uh, is John. Much. John Nellis, uh, who's the wildlife technician here at the Houghton Lake Deer Research Station, and he's how old? He's about eight months old, and uh, he was bottle raised. That's. Sort of unusual, isn't it, for a deer to become this tame or not? Uh, usually, uh, if they brought in and uh, you know raised on a bottle by humans, they lose their fear of humans. Even if they're even if they're raised in a household with dogs around, they'll lose their fear of dogs. We've had that happen too. Now, Maynard is not very large. A lot of people think of deer as being you know quite a substantial animal, a big game animal. Uh, how much do you suppose he weighs? Uh, he'll weigh probably about 75 to 80 pounds. And uh, when he gets full grown, he'll weigh what? He'll weigh up around 140, 150 pounds. Now, has he had his antlers removed? No, he's just, as you can feel those, that, that's his first uh, antlers there. They're just buttons. That's uh, yeah, where they get the uh, button buck. Well, he's more interested in my glove than anything, my mitten. Here, Maynard, come here. The fur on a deer, they have hollow hair, don't they? Right. In the wintertime, their fur is hollow. In the spring, <clears throat> in the summer, the reddish-colored coat is a fine uh, uh, hair. It's a lot lighter. In the winter, this, they lose that in the fall. In the winter, they've got this dark uh, brownish, and it's a hollow. It adds insulation, helps them make it through the winter months. Now, they, he'll lose this hair in the spring? Right. In the uh, spring, he'll, this will shed, and then he'll come out with a fine red coat that uh, you see on deer in the summer. Come here, Maynard. Come here. <laughs> and, of course, the hooves on the deer, these are the, the, the dangerous part of a deer, right? That's true. It's not so much the antlers. Usually, uh, yeah, the does uh, will fight with their hose rather than uh, any other way. We're going to have to go over here and move to Maynard. These deer are not too accustomed to being on camera. But the little button buck Maynard, an eight-month-old deer, right here at the Houghton Lake Deer Research Station. You can see how small they are. An interesting creature. Makes an interesting wildlife sketch in Michigan outdoors. Well, everybody knows how important white-tailed deer are to this state. Glenn Dutterer, you're the Extension Wildlife Specialist at Michigan State. Is the deer the most important animal to this state? Well, I'd hate to, hate to pick the most important, but it certainly is one of the more important because of the way it affects everybody's lives, as well as sportsmen. These little critters right here really affect a lot of lives in the outdoors. Oh, they most assuredly do. Not near as glamorous as the white-tailed deer, but these meadow mice are very important animals, even to the white-tailed deer, but to us as, as well, to, to everybody who's interested in the outdoors and who buys things like apples or Christmas trees. The, well, it, move them around okay. here a little bit so we can see Let's these. Take a look at it. This is a meadow mouse, and the thing that makes a meadow mouse is the short tail, and you can see the short ears and the, the grizzle-colored fur. Uh, this is the animal that lives wild in the fields uh, throughout the state and throughout much of North America. The classic field mouse. The field mouse. Not to be confused with the house mouse. You would never find these living in your attic, would you? Oh, they might come in periodically and leave, but they get their food from the outside. No, the house mouse has the long ears and the long mm -hmm. tail, and it lives in homes. It's what we call, if you let me use the jargon, an obligate human parasite. It's dependent on us. These are wild animals. They're free living outside, but when the weather turns fierce, they might come inside in the fall. They are extremely abundant in the woods. Anybody who's been out rabbit hunting sees mice scurrying about. Even in the summer, you'll see them running through the weeds. Any idea how many there are? Oh, my goodness, no. But uh, from estimates, they can range up anywhere from 50 to 300 per acre. And in times when they increase dramatically, oh, sometimes even more, up to five, 600 per acre for short periods of time. What about the um, sex life of the uh, meadow mouse? Uh, active or? Extremely prolific. They're, you know, they're fast livers, and they reproduce fast. So they, they become sexually active before they're fully mature. They start producing young within a month of birth. They wow. reproduce throughout the entire year, uh, although they, they reach peak periods of reproduction in the, in the summer and fall. You mean uh, during these cold winter nights, 
there might be in some little burrows around in the weeds. There might be meadow mice. Sure. Making more meadow mice. You bet. Uh, they reproduce under the snow quite well. <laughs> Are they fighting right now? Sure. They'll, they're, they're a very aggressive little animal. Uh, they have to be uh, in order to survive. And so, yeah, you've got them a little excited, the bright lights, and so now they're fussing with one another. Why are they so important to sportsmen? Well, one, they feed our major predators. These are the guys that convert summer sunshine into winter food for hawks, owls, foxes, coyotes, a raccoon, mink. And also, when, when these animals are extremely abundant, uh, the predators eat them because they're the easiest thing to, to catch. Uh, and that means that, that perhaps uh, the predators don't feed as much on some of the game animals that the sportsmen are interested in, such as the, the pheasant or the quail or the grouse or the cottontail rabbit. The meadow mouse. Really, one of the most important animals we have in Michigan outdoors. Well, any animal that, that eats grass and then is mm -hmm. food for other animals has got to be a very important link in the food chain. Well, keep your eye out for them in the woods and fields of Michigan outdoors, and I'm sure you'll see a lot of them. Well, thanks a lot, Glenn. Yeah. Great wildlife sketch, as usual. Now, these meadow mice and Maynard the deer, and even I had trouble keeping warm during those. That was 10 below when we, when we taped that up cold, there. Right? 10 below zero. I had a snowmobile suit on. So I kept pretty warm. Now, Terry Luttrell, you're the education coordinator for Michigan United Conservation Clubs. And of course, one facet of education that a lot of people need to know is how to keep warm in winter. If I tell you I got cold last weekend, uh, being out in the woods, whatever I was doing, that my feet were cold, my hands were cold, what's your first suggestion? Put a hat on. And, uh, <laughs> of course, I did that. That's one thing I had on. But a lot of people are going to wonder, a hat, it isn't big enough to keep you warm. Sure. Well. One of the basic principles of keeping heat within your body is keeping your head covered because the blood vessels in your head don't constrict. So they're just perfect radiators. 50 to 80 percent of your body heat is going to go right out your head. So if your fingers or your hands or your feet are cold, put a hat on and that will force all that heat that will be lost from your head back to the rest of your body. Likewise, if you're getting warm outdoors and starting to sweat. Well, you can take your off hat off. The hat. Right. Or you can also open up your collar. Okay, now let's get to the, uh, the tootsies here, the other end, the feet. What do you suggest wearing on your feet? Wool well, socks? You can wear wool socks, although a lot of people have problems. This is a wool nylon blend here. Uh, with wool against the skin might cause some itching. So you wear something like a cotton or a silk sock underneath, and that'll help wick away the moisture, the perspiration from your foot, and pass it out through the wool. When you, say, your feet. When, when you say wick away, that's like something that will take the moisture take away the from moisture, your body. Draw it right away. Just draw it right away from your body. Uh, okay, and let it evaporate. Now, this mm -hmm. happens to be my favorite little number. Looks like some kind of negligee or maybe a, a gill net that might be stretched across Lake Michigan somewhere, but it isn't. It's one of the useful, most useful undergarments that a person can wear. And it's based on the same principle that we just saw with the meadow voles and Maynard the deer. What it's basically doing is trapping the air between your mm -hmm. skin and whatever you have over the top of this. And that's what we're trying to do when we stay warm is trap air. Air is a great insulator as long as it doesn't move. Obviously, if you just wear this, it's not going to do you any good. No. So you have to put something over it to trap the air between the holes. Like what? What do you recommend? Well, you can wear a cotton T-neck, something similar to this. This would trap the air uh, between your skin and this. Mm -hmm. And this would keep you warm. Cotton, though, when it gets wet, if it gets wet from perspiration or gets wet from the outside, is terrible. If you ever been outside with oh, yes. uh, jeans and they get wet, you know what I mean. Jeans are really not that great to wear outdoors because they get wet. Here's something like wool pants. Recommend definitely wool. Wool keeps you warm even when wet up to a point. Well, the, yeah, the moisture can dry out of wool. And of course, right. a good wool shirt like this, that's a, that would be a favorite. You could wear it over over the fishnet underwear mm -hmm. and the turtleneck and, the and turtle put neck. this on top. And this would keep you dry even when it gets wet, similar to a, a wool sweater, the same concept. Except there is one problem with wool. After about 15% absorption in the fibers, mm -hmm. within the fibers themselves, wool will no longer keep you wet or keep you dry. And the new item that's coming out now that a lot of outdoors people are starting to use is the fleece, the double-piled fleece. Okay, this is what it's called, fleece. and this. This will take more moisture and this still keep you warm? This will get soaking wet, and you can still stay very warm with this. You okay. can wring it out and stay warm. Well, keep that fleece in mind, but a lot of people are going to go back to the old. This is about the warmest jacket you can get. It doesn't look like a jacket, but it Hold certainly it is. This Long is known as the warmest you can this get. This is a down jacket. Uh, the basic principle is the same again. We're trapping air within between the feathers of the down right here. If and it works for ducks, it's got to be... Uh, 
be great for humans right. as far as the, the insulating value. Of course, ducks, when they get wet, well, they're wet all the time, but they oil their outer feathers and okay. keep the down underneath. If down gets wet, it's, it will do you absolutely no good. It will it. draw heat, body heat away from you, so you want to make sure that you don't get wet. What do you wear over? It would well, be a good idea to wear something over down, say, if it was raining. Right. You want to wear something like this that will keep both the rain and the wind away from you, too, mm -hmm. because wind will also draw that body heat away. Now, here's something handy. I like wearing vests outdoors. And here's a, this is a down vest? This is a down vest. A nice feature on this vest, and anything when you're looking for uh, coats or vests, is you want to get a, a waistband that will keep the air from coming up from below and taking it away from you. This built, will help you stay Built warm. right in. Built right so in. So the wind won't zip up like that. Well, the Terry. principle of the vest is that you want to keep your trunk warm, because that's where all your vital organs are. So if you had a vest like this and a hat, some mittens, Nice warm socks and something roll on so you don't, don't stay wet. And if you stay dry, you're going to keep warm. Right, you'll enjoy the outdoors. Great, Terry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, those are some good tips. And we're now we're going to we're going to get into something really hot. Now we had an issue we talked about on the show a couple weeks ago about the ban on handguns that's been proposed in the legislature. We get any mail on that at all? Right, for it did we? A lot of people wrote in saying that they hadn't even heard about it until they saw our show. Well, let's, initiative them. let's find out what some of our viewers had to say about the ban on handguns. All right. From Hazlitt, limiting gun ownership will only needlessly interfere with the lawful use of firearms by hunters and sportsmen and make it more difficult for people to defend themselves, their homes, and their families. The real issue here is the willingness of some people to commit lawless acts, and that is a much larger social con question. From Saginaw. Please don't take away the sportsman's privileges and enjoyment just because of a few sick people running the streets that the lawmakers just don't seem to want to do anything about. From Mason, we have enough gun laws if they are enforced. By the way, I don't own a handgun and never have, but I feel our freedoms are being eroded away too much. From Ypsilanti, if we lose this right, how many more rights will we lose? Lincoln Park, once they tried to prohibit the use of alcohol and look at what happened. From Corona. The underworld will probably make more money and put more handguns in the hands of criminals than ever before. This from Burton. I target practice regularly, and it is also a means of protection in the home. I'm not a radical. I have no police record. I just enjoy this sport. It's one of my favorite pastimes. So when those that oppose handguns give up their golf clubs, chessboards, snowmobiles, or jogging shoes, then I will consider giving up my sport. From Gaines. Would you like to be a Polish citizen unable to defend yourself against an oppressive government? Our greatest enemy, I believe, to be a government gone haywire. I love my country and fear no such difficulty at this time. I'm not willing to gamble on my future, however. And this last one from Plymouth. We might as well pass a law making overeating illegal. Overeating causes obesity, which leads to heart disease, and that is our number one killer. I don't like giving up any of my freedom, do you? Those were the views of our viewers on handgun control. We did have a few letters that were pro-control, but they ran 25 to 1. Right. That's the way our mailbag stacked up. Stacked up. Thank you, Ed. Mm -hmm. Oh, we keep moving from one hot subject to another. It gets warmer and warmer around here. Dr. Howard Tanner, director of the Department of Natural Resources. Welcome to Michigan Outdoors. I've had so many people say, great, you're going to have Tanner on the show. Boy, asking this, asking this, asking this, you know, uh, see if you can pin him down. I mean, he's so controversial. The DNR has been characterized in turmoil and controversy and so on. Why is this, Dr. Tanner? Why is everybody after you? Fred, I don't think everybody is after me. Uh, I, I think that there are some people who have their opinions and are able to express them in a very public way. Well, see, your, your commission has been divided at times. There's been uh, people from all flanks. But you know, I, I gotta say honestly, when I called up different people and critics and asked, what, what should I ask him? What do you recommend? And they said, well, he's gonna be hard to pin down. There's no real smoking gun in his hand. I said, well, what is the beef? What's the beef, you know? Why, why do people want him removed? And, and they say, well, there's just a lot of reasons. His administrative style. Well, what's the matter with it? Well, it doesn't really communicate to well. Morale is low in the department. You catch the blame for all the things that are wrong in the department, right? I suspect that any senior executive catches the blame for that organization. Certainly true of my case. The only part of that that I would respond to, Fred, is uh, the question on morale. Yes, uh, uh, the criticism has been made that the morale in the department is low. I would point out that uh, it's been my unfortunate uh, 
duty to lay off about 600 people. Uh, many that other, tends to bump some people out. Many other people are, feel very, very threatened about their jobs. But do you think that, that, that the DNR is an exception in these days in Michigan? I would ask the readers or the listeners, uh, what do they think about their morale in their mm -hmm. shop or in their organization or in their school? I think morale in Michigan is kind of low in general. And I would worry about morale in an organization that wasn't productive. And if somebody wants to criticize the organization, I would ask them to look at what we produce and how well we do it. I think we stand rather high. Okay, now I want to ask you a question. This was in Michigan Out of Doors magazine when you talked to the MUCC Board of Directors. You said at that meeting that uh, you think that you should get a C plus or a B minus in a, as an administrator. And some people say, why should we have a C plus or B minus administrator running the agency? Because my principal job is not administration. I happen to think, and maybe this sounds egotistical, but I, I happen to think that the, the role as a leader and leadership in selection of the appropriate goals for Michigan is my task. Uh, there are many people who are good administrators, and I've hired a number of them. So administration is being taken care of and taken care of very well. It doesn't happen to be my personal bag. I wasn't raised that way. And you make no bones about it. I make no bones about it. Okay. On the other hand, I've been at this seven years, and I'm a lot better administrator today than I was seven years ago. I have a feeling, a distinct feeling, and a lot of people do too, that although I don't think they make the link, you know, they, they blame Tanner for uh, oh, bungling this, bungling that, not being clear about this. Why in the world is the state fair a part of the DNR? What does that have to do with natural resources? What does that have to do with hunting and fishing? which is what this agency was originally supposed to be about. I, I'm glad you asked the question. Uh, the State Fair is not the State Fair, it's the State Fair grounds. It's 160 acres of open space in almost downtown Detroit. The citizens group that reviewed the situation and decided where they would like to recommend to the legislature to put the State Fair had that in mind when they said give it to the DNR let them build a year-round program of interface between the outer doors and the inner city and to do it in an educational sense and to do it in a demonstrational sense. And that's what we're doing, and I invite anybody to come down there and have a look. Okay, now we do happen to be having Outdoorama uh, from February 19th to the 28th. Outdoorama at the State Fair. Where do Outdoorama used to be? Well, at the Armory. See? Okay, now, now, we have placed, I think, in a much better place for that, and that's an example of what I'm talking about. Okay, we're going to have on Friday night, February 26th, Michigan Outdoors Night, sort of based around the show. Would you be willing to come down and discuss with the public the DNR? Is it too big? Is it too sprawling? I will be happy to be there. I will be there. Super. Okay, we got you booked for that one. Let me ask you a couple more questions real quick. Pheasants, have you written them off? No, no. Pheasant uh, populations in Michigan uh, will be somewhat improved. Not, not perhaps to what people remember in the late 40s, but there are a number of things we can do, and we're started. Um, Indian fishing, what's going to happen there? Indians won. Most difficult natural resource issue at the moment is the Indian treaty fishing. It's my expectations that, you're right, the Indians won. Uh, they won something. Uh, we're now in the process of defining that, and their right to fish, probably in a commercial sense, uh, will be a subject of negotiations. I believe those will be successful, and that I expect we'll conclude those in the next uh, two or three months. Okay, let's break right here. What is your opinion? What do you think? Is the DNR too big? Write to us at Michigan Outdoors. Box 1 East Lansing. Is Tanner doing a good job? Uh, is the department too sprawling? Uh, or is it just the way it should be? Should, should they be burying cattle in PBB? Write us. We'll put your opinion on, and we'll see you down at Outdoorama, Dr. Tanner. Right now, speaking of fishing, let's sort of lighten it up a little bit from the Indian fishing controversy and some of these other things. Let's go to our trophy report where we have some master angler fish that uh, I think you're going to be impressed with. The steelhead is a rainbow trout that migrates to the ocean on the west coast where it's native. It was introduced to Michigan years ago where it migrates to the Great Lakes. This 16-pound, 15-ounce trophy was caught off Allegan County by Tom Sneller of Holland trolling with a Northport nailer in August. Brown trout are native to Europe. 
They stay relatively small in our streams, but when they migrate to the Great Lakes, they also fatten up on alewives and smelt. Lady angler Monica Zakrewski from Parma took this 23-pound six-ouncer from East Grand Traverse Bay in July, trolling with a rebel. And lastly, the king of Michigan salmon, the Chinook, also referred to as king salmon, was introduced along with the coho starting in the mid-1960s. They grow larger than any other salmon species. This 34 and a half pounder gives you the idea. Harold Atherton of Ludington caught it trolling in Lake Michigan with a J plug. What color J plug? Well, he says it was blue, red, yellow, and white. And that makes Harold our master angler of the week, taking the title with flying colors. Of course, most sportsmen, they get trophies like that, they're going to have them mounted at, but uh, if you've got a nice size for eating, how would you cook it? Well, geez, there's so many different ways. Okay, let me clarify something for you. Let me suggest a recipe, sherry baked salmon steaks. A great recipe. You can do it in a camper, just like I did a couple years ago. There I am. I'm, I'm working on the ingredients right there. Ah. I'm also trying to grow a mustache at the time. But you can fix this recipe with a baking dish. Just a few basic uh, uh, utensils. You're gonna want some paper towels, and uh, here are the ingredients. You might want to jot them down. You're gonna need some salt, some pepper, some dill weed. Dill weed really adds the flavor to this. Vegetable oil, of course. We're gonna brown these salmon steaks. And then from the refrigerator, get some butter. Uh, we'll have a little bit of uh, dry sherry wine, onion, green pepper, sour cream, Oh, sound good already? Mm, I can't wait. And there they are, the salmon steaks. You could probably do this with fillets, but it's really good this way. Salmon, of course, have very large bones. And uh, when they're staked, they're easy to freeze. And the way we're going to cook them here, the bones come out very easily and the skin comes off. What you do first, a lot of times when you bake fish, you know, you don't uh, brown them first. But we're going to brown it like you would a, a pot roast, a venison shoulder roast, or something like that. Salt and pepper and flour. Dredge the salmon steaks in the flour and uh, put it in. It doesn't have to be a frying pan. You can cook it in the same pan that you use uh, to bake them in. Just a baking dish. You put some butter in there, or about two tablespoons of butter, and also two tablespoons of shortening. Put them both in there. So we take the salmon steaks, dredged in flour, a little salt and pepper, and brown them on both sides. Now, of course, a lot of people just fry fish that way. And right. it's good, it's good. It's stop right there. Of course, if I was going to fry fish, I wouldn't fry steaks. Rather fry a filet would be a little bit better. Now we're going to heat up the oven. Preheat the oven at 400 degrees because we, uh, we don't brown them too long. Brown them quickly. Look at that. Doesn't that look mm. tasty? So that's getting them partially cooked right there. Turn them over. You don't have to have a, you know, any extra room to speak of. About four of the steaks fits very nicely in a dish like that. Now this is Chinook salmon. You can use any salmon or even the trouts, but it's good with salmon. Now we're going to put the wine in there. Dry sherry, about a half a cup, give or take a little bit. This is when we put the lid right on the baking dish and pop them in the oven. 400 degrees for 10 minutes. See, that's phase mm. two. The first phase is you brown them quickly, then you pop them in the oven with the sherry for 10 minutes. Now that's going to sort of steam them in there. Start getting them moist. Now you'll take the uh, sour cream, a cup, a full cup of sour cream, chop up very finely about a quarter cup of onion and about oh, a tablespoon, couple tablespoons of finely chopped green pepper. And then we add the dill weed, about a half teaspoon. Not too much, because it has a little punch to it. It really adds flavor. You already have the onion and the green pepper in there. But a half teaspoon of dill weed. Now we take it out of the oven. It's been in the oven 10 minutes at 400 degrees. Take it out and put this mixture over the top. Chopped onion, dill weed, chopped green pepper, and sour cream. Spread it over the top and put it back in the oven uncovered. Mm. So we browned it and we put it in the oven covered with the sherry wine. And then we put that mixture on top, put it back in the oven uncovered. Now, 15 minutes or longer. So this whole recipe might only take you a half hour 
or until the salmon is done. You can clean up the top of the stove there. The, when the topping is lightly browned, that's when you can take it out of the oven. Oh boy, is this good. Look at the way that flakes right off of there, Ed. That looks delicious. Oh, it's just scrumptious, and it comes right off the bone. And you know in, a, in fish like uh, salmon, they have great big rib bones. So it's no problem. You're not going to have any problem. If you get a salmon bone caught in your throat, you tried to eat the whole thing. Slow down a little bit. There are some concerns about eating salmon from the Great Lakes, certain parts of the Great Lakes, whether the chemical contamination uh, is hazardous to your health or not. And we have to address that problem here on Michigan Outdoors. Uh, what we're going to do is, I recommend this recipe heartily, but there are some suggestions that the Department of Public Health has and the DNR next week on Michigan Outdoors. We're going to have Wayne Schmidt from Michigan United Conservation Clubs, a staff ecologist, and we're going to get right into this question about are your fish safe to eat? So that's going to be something you're going to want to watch. But I tell you, that recipe can't be beat. Doesn't look like it could be, Fred. Okay, let's get over here to the map and talk about this weekend. You've learned on this show how to keep warm, put a hat on. Now you have no excuses. You can head to the Upper Peninsula where we have three to four feet of snow on the ground. Good snow up there, too. A lot of snow a couple feet into the northern lower peninsula and down south. Well, it's a little sparse in some areas, but the ice is plenty thick for ice fishing. I'll make a suggestion off Trenton, the Estro Beach area. Reports are for the few fishermen that have gone out, they've done very, very well on perch, about 150 yards offshore four feet of water. They're biting like crazy. Now they're eight to nine inch perch. Maybe nothing to write home about uh, if you're a Saginaw Bay fisherman, but for down in that area, those Lake Erie perch, those are big ones. Join me next week right here on Michigan Outdoors. We have a real great lineup. Hope to see you then. Have a good weekend. Funding for the preceding program was made possible in part by a grant from Farm Bureau Insurance Group and its agents throughout Michigan. Shore and woodlands of the north, its history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again, and all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan. Sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow And the stillness of the forest lies encased in arctic cold The wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can It tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan